I think when we talk about uh, uh, grown-up congenital heart disease, it's extremely important that before the advent of cardiac surgery, less than one-fifth of children born with congenital heart disease would actually reach adulthood. And most of these survivors actually had a mild disease. Only exceptionally would some more severe or complex defects survive into their 20s or 30s. But what has really changed in terms of congenital heart disease is the, is the management of these patients. And now with successes of surgical ma management and more recently with uh, card interventional catheterization, I think we have reversed the prognosis for these children with congenital heart disease. And now more than 90% of these patients are expected to reach adulthood. And most deaths from congenital heart disease now occur in adults rather than uh, occurring in children. Now, if you look at the data, current data from any developed world, there are more adults with congenital heart disease than children. And I think that's understandable in those parts of the world because their growth rates have declined so much that there are less and less children born with congenital heart disease, and there are more and more children who have survived the con congenital heart disease because of quality of surgery and intervention, and they are now uh, representing adults. So adults with congenital heart disease really uh, uh, represent a special challenge, and that challenge is both ways in our part of the world, those who are repaired lesions and those who are unrepaired lesions. And I think this diversity makes this specialty a very special one. Now, what do we know about burden of uh, adult congenital heart disease or grown-up congenital heart disease in our country? The answer is we don't. I think we do not have true birth prevalence study in our country. We really do not know the exact incidence uh, and the survival rate of various lesions in terms of natural history would also be not very well known, although it's relatively known. If you look at the current population, I think we are about 240 million. Our birth rate is about 2%. So even if we assume eight per thousand live births, there are 40 to 50,000 infants born with congenital heart disease every year. Now, what about the adult congenital? I think there are two types of adult congenital that you will be seeing. Those who are natural survivors and those who are now being operated uh, and become adults with congenital heart disease. And now we know that there are at least 12 centers in the country who are actually operating upon these children with congenital heart disease all across Pakistan. The only unfortunate province where we do not have congenital cardiac surgery at the moment uh, is, is actually Balochistan, which is extremely uh, unfortunate. So if we make an, an assumption of natural history, I think about 60,000 simple lesions, about 30,000 moderate lesions, another five to 10,000 uh, severe lesions, annual increase would be about 4,000 and assumed pool will be 50,000. So there are at least more than 100,000 adults with congenital heart disease, be it natural survivors or those who have been operated in this country. Now, let me put you through this very, very important study, which has recently been submitted to the 8th World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery. I know there are limitations to the study because it has been done by people who were not trained uh, pediatric car cardiologists, but they were trained echocardiographers. This is from District Rain Yar Khan, uh, Dr. Faisal Hassan and his team, and I was involved with them. The age group is five to 15 years. They randomly selected 11 villages of previously published study in heart, which was way back in 2004. And you will be surprised that of the 1500 school children who were screened, there were 14 children who had congenital heart disease and none of them knew that the child had congenital heart disease. So unoperated, undetected, undiagnosed congenital heart disease incidence is 9.3 per thousand, which is about 0.9%. And you can see the mean age group was about 10 years. When we looked at the details as what type of lesions these children had, a majority of them as expected were atrial septal defects, 35%. 28% had uh, ventricular septal defects, some of them with Eisenmenger. Uh, mitral valve prolapse with mitral regurgitation, 28%. Bicuspid aortic valve with aortic regurgitation, 14%. And congenitally corrected transposition, 7%. So you can imagine the natural survivors of congenital heart disease are still 0.9 per thousand, and uh, sorry, 14 per thousand. So 
I think if we extrapolate this number, then the probably the incidence of congenital heart disease in our population is significantly higher than rest of the world. Most of these children belong to uh, poor socioeconomic, consanguinity was there. And most surprising was that the similar study from the same region way back in 2004, the incidence was 4.8 per thousand. But I think we should remember that study was not based on portable color echocardiogram. That was based on clinical uh, 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 sort of acumen. So it is expected that there will be discrepancy over here. So let's come to this issue of management now. Now, who should be looking after these children? Uh, not these children, but adults with congenital heart disease. At the moment, I think majority of pediatric cardiologists are looking after these patients. But should adult cardiologists be seeing them? Because most of them, now that they know that there is a congenital heart disease expert in the field, they would be referring these patients to pediatric uh, uh, cardiologists. Uh, should it be a combined management? The answer is we need to develop the specialty of adult congenital cardiology. And I think the time has already arrived. Let's look at the issues of management very quickly for next five minutes before I conclude my uh, presentation. So unrepaired congenital heart disease with pulmonary hypertension, I think this is the major group. This is the largest group, which I will be slightly highlighting as well. Pregnancy, uh, I get almost a referral almost every day of a pregnant lady who has a congenital or acquired heart disease uh, who's pregnant and, and needs to be managed. And of course, this is something which is a very specialized field arrhythmias, endocarditis, premature ventricular dysfunction, residue of repaired uh, congenital heart disease, anticoagulation, lifestyle issues, heart failure and transplant, we spoke about that. And of course, these patients are not immune to uh, uh, acquired heart disease. So one day they would also be developing hypertension and coronary artery disease, which of course uh, our adult colleagues are far better in terms of management. Similarly, unoperated congenital heart disease. The, the, once I mentioned earlier on, if you look at that data from Rahim Yar Khan, majority of the patients were either atrial septal defects or ventricular septal defects. Of course, they didn't find any child with PDA, although I think the, the incidence of PDA is fairly similar to ventricular septal defect in our population. Eisenmenger syndrome, uh, un, uh, sort of uh, diagnosed coarctation, uh, pulmonary stenosis, congenitally tried, uh, corrected transposition, and of course, natural survivors of cyanotic congenital heart disease, uh, which we see in our clinical practice, uh, patients with tetralogy of fellows and Epstein's presenting as adults. Now, if you look at the operated adult congenital heart disease, late closures would lead to Eisenmenger syndrome. Then remember, when you repair tetralogy, you never do a total correction. A very large number of these patients with retrology of fellows would need pulmonary valve replacement. And I was very pleased to see presentation from Brigadier Khurram yesterday, where he showed uh, uh, their uh, case series of patients who have uh, been uh, uh, having transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. I think that's the thing of the future which we need to think. And if you look at the pool of these patients with a repaired tetralogy of fellows, you can imagine what number of patients would be needing pulmonary valve replacement in the near future. Of course, those who had bidirectional gland or fontan, those who had um, conduits, post restally or post ROS, and post interventions like device closure, post tenting need follow up for the rest of their life. I will only be focusing on just one lesion for next few minutes, and that's Eisenmenger syndrome. The reason I say that, or the reason I chose that out of all the legends was because this is something where major controversy arises, and that is the largest pool of patients which we see at the moment in terms of unoperated. Of course, it represents the most advanced form of pulmonary arterial hypertension associated with congenital heart disease, and any untreated congenital heart disease with intracardiac communication leads to reversal of flow. Now, if we look at the survival curve of Eisenmenger syndrome, you can see uh, what is their mean age and when is it that they start actually getting all these problems uh, which you would see in patients uh, with Eisenmenger syndrome. So what do we do with these patients? I think most of the times it's only palliative treatment. Uh, you need to make sure that they are not very, uh, they do not have a high erythrocyte count, rule out dehydration. If symptoms of hyperviscosity and hematocrit is greater than 65%, we sometimes consider phlebotomy uh, up to 250 to 500 
extremely careful. I've seen adults dying of phlebotomy because it was unsupervised or not done appropriately. It's extremely important to hydrate them first. And if anything, I think a 10 cc per kilogram or a smaller amount at multiple times is much better than actually taking out a large amount. And you should have a very high threshold of phlebotomy in these patients. And those who actually have definite uh, signs of hyperviscosity should only be phlebotomized. Hemoptysis and bleeding, I think patients with long-standing cyanosis, they develop bronchial collaterals and that lead to hemoptysis. Uh, we resuscitate them. Sometimes they have massive acute bleeding and that can be the reason for their mortality as well. Of course, uh, you can give them uh, FFP, cryoprecipitate platelets, uh, but sometimes we need to go ahead and percutaneously close these vessels uh, in a potential therapeutic measure in these patients with Eisenmenger syndrome. Anticoagulation, I think, not routinely used in these patients, say, particularly in our setup because we have increased risk of hemoptysis. We do not screen these patients very well, and they can have stroke or a hemorrhage as well. So we often end up giving them aspirin uh, rather than putting them on true anticoagulation. And of course, uh, pulmonary artery thrombosis is something that you worry about as their age increases. Uh, they develop biventricular dysfunction, and then um, I think we can consider aspirin in these patients as a prophylactic measure. What about general measures in these patients? I think avoid sudden fluid shifts, dehydration. Uh, they must be told not to be dehydrated because that's when they would actually get uh, stroke, unfortunately. Avoid very hot or humid conditions, which obviously may exacerbate their vasodilatation causing syncope or right to left shunting. Uh, you sometimes need to give them home oxygen. And of course, continuous home oxygen therapy is better than nocturnal supplementation. Uh, many of my patients actually have oxygen at home and do not forget to give them uh, infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Uh, you don't need to stop these patients uh, in terms of physical activity because most of the times they restrict themselves uh, but their mental and neurodevelopmental issues need to be looked at. We are not experts in acquired cardiovascular disease, so they need to be referred to an adult cardiologist as and when that uh, coronary artery disease or hypertension arises. And of course, associated conditions, diabetes, mellitus, hepatitis, or any other non-cardiac surgery issues need to be looked at in these patients. And I think as I said earlier, except that the patient has ventricular dysfunction, severe outflow tract obstruction or a hemodynamically significant arrhythmia or aortic dilatation, you don't, don't need to stop that patient. Because otherwise, if we put too much restrictions, they get into depression and then you are putting them on antidepressants as well because they cannot take part even in routine daily activities of life. I think one of the most important things in these patients is their mental health, which we often ignore. And I think the quality of life has to be looked at patients with acquired congenital heart disease or though adult congenital heart disease, they must be referred uh, for appropriate uh, mental evaluation and treatment if you has, see any signs of depression or anxiety in them. Of course, acquired cardiovascular disease, I do not want to take too much time on that because uh, adult, adult cardiologists would be looking at that. But I think as, as a congenital heart disease expert, it's our important duty to refer these patients and not everything needs to be related to their underlying congenital heart disease in that context. And of course, their associated conditions like diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, hepatitis. You would be surprised in terms of incidence of obesity in these patients because they are physically inactive, so they tend to become obese. And I think that is again something which needs to be looked at when we are managing these patients. And many of the referrals which we get uh, from our colleagues, be it obstetrics, general surgery or otherwise, is which patients should be given anesthesia or not. I think this is something which we need to be expert in that too as well. I think uh, lastly, who should be looking after these patients? I think it could fall between, uh, at the moment it's an orphan specialty. There are not enough even pediatric cardiologists in the country to look after children with congenital heart disease. What to talk of adults with congenital heart disease whose population is growing from day to day. And what we are facing significantly is a transition. Their transition from pediatric to adult service has become a major issue. I'm still seeing many adults uh, even being at a children's hospital because nobody wants to look after them. And the number of 
uh, people who can look after these patients that you could trust are not adequate. And I think that's why it's extremely important that the adult regional cardiac centers should take this responsibility. So AFIC in Rawalpindi, NICVD in Karachi, PIC in Pindi, uh, Lahore, Peshawar Institute of Cardiology in in um, in Peshawar, uh, similarly in Faisalabad, in Multan, I think the adult cardiac centers and the pediatric cardiology team over there needs to start training these people with uh, who needs to be trained in adult congenital heart disease. I have already spoken to and written to the president CPS to hold a joint meeting of pediatric cardiology faculty and adult cardiology faculty. And I think that is going to happen very soon within next few weeks. And I think we need to work out this specialty so that we can start training these doctors both from both tracks. You will need, a, you will have adult cardiologists interested in adult congenital disease and you will have pediatric cardiologists who would be interested in adult. So the route has to be bilateral. The training will be different. So if an adult cardiologist comes here, I think he might need a slightly longer period of time to be trained as an adult congenital expert as compared to a pediatric cardiologist who already has, uh, has expertise in the field. And of course, it's a multidisciplinary team at the moment involving pediatric, adult, obstetrician, psychologist, uh, electrophysiologist, and pulmonary hypertension experts who, would, who are looking after these patients. So I think coming to the end i think the solution lies first awareness i think we need to educate not only our adult cardiologists our uh, physicians and pediatricians but i think a joint care to begin with between a pediatric cardiologist and our adult cardiologist uh, and once the fellowship in adult congenital with specific entry criteria then i think establishment of an adult congenital program in every adult cardiology setup is the answer at the moment. So I would like to conclude by saying that Gooch or adult congenital is a full-time specialty. It's not a part-time specialty, please. I think we have to be very, very committed to be an adult congenital specialist. It's something which requires a fundamental background knowledge of congenital heart disease as well as acquired heart disease. So you need to be an expert in both congenital and acquired. So it's a full-time specialty experts can come from both routes but need to be adequately trained management does not involve interventions only we often start thinking that device closure of asd or coarctation stenting means adult congenital expert i'm sorry that's not an adult congenital special that's just a very small amount of management of adults with congenital heart disease and i think high volume of surgery and interventions for adult congenital is important so competence for these procedures needs consideration. And I think the time has arrived to formalize the specialty and its training. Um, I think uh, uh, the American College of Cardiology Task Force recommends at least two years for adult cardiologists as well as pediatric cardiologists. We need to work out in our own local setup as how we are going to do that. But faculties of adult and pediatric cardiology need to sit and formalize that training. And the initial supervisors will be primarily a pediatric cardiologists working in these adult congenital setups, but partly adult cardiologists as well, because they need to be trained in both congenital and acquired heart disease. Thank you very much.